Buenos dias, buenas tardes, for those of you on the East Coast like myself. Uh, my name is Jeronimo Saldana. I am a Chicano activist from LA, currently in Brooklyn. Uh, and I am beyond thrilled to be a part of this conversation. Uh, it's a conversation that rarely happens, that wouldn't have happened last year, maybe not even uh, you know, two years ago, definitely not 10 years ago. So I, I am beyond honored uh, to be able to be here with these amazing leaders, our community leaders, uh, powerful folks like Ashley and Michelle Monterrosa, who lost their brother Sean uh, to police violence, who have been on the front lines fighting for other impacted families, fighting for justice, waking up the Latino community, the Latinx community, letting them know that police abuse is a Latino issue, is one of our issues. With the, the informidable, uncomparable Carmen Perez Jordan, who's been on these streets for decades, who has been one of the, the leaders that has allowed us to have this conversation here today. Without Carmen's work, without her, her blood, her sweat, and her tears all over this nation, we would not be able to talk to you today about police violence against Latinxes. And, and with the documentarian, the funder, Jimmy Briggs, who I am honored to meet for the first time and I am excited to hear from and to talk about how we can move forward with our communities to, to understand how we stop this, this century-old violence against our gente. Because if you think about it, the criminal justice system has been used against our folks since day one. I'm thinking about the, the, the prohibition of marijuana in 1914 in El Paso as a forum to criminalize Mexicans. I'm thinking about stop and frisk here in New York and all the other tools that are used to oppress our people and our gente. So as we get started, first, I want to thank Jasmine Chavez, the visionary, the amazing, the brilliant, the wonderful, the compassionate, who, who had the foresight to include this necessary conversation. So huge gracias to you, Jasmine, for your leadership always. Before we get started, I wanted just to take a moment and say some of the names of the folks that I carry in my heart that, that are never lifted up, that too rarely are heard. So, of course, I want to mention Sean Monterrosa. I want to mention Jesse Hernandez, who was killed in Denver, I believe, in 2015, and Eric Salgado, who was also killed, I believe, last year. Andres Guardado, just a kid in Los Angeles who was murdered as well. Adam Toledo, who was just a baby, 16 years old, I believe, if not younger. Francisco Serna, grandfather with dementia, who was killed by Bakersfield PD. Paul Rea, who was killed in Los Angeles. Just want to bring these folks into the space and to keep them in our heart while we have this conversation. So to get us started, just some quick backstory. There is no national database showing us how many folks have actually been killed by the police, if you can imagine that. It's cobbled together state by state, department by department, and Latino representation has been undercounted thanks to a recent study released by uh, Somos US, Unidos US, I can't remember their name, NCLR, whatever they are now, my apologies to you. Uh, powerful report that let us know that between 2014 and now, over 2,653 Latinos have been murdered by the police. And we didn't know that before, and it's important to know who is being impacted, who is being abused. Also, we're, we're seeing never before seen attention thanks to black organizing. Thanks to the Black Lives Matter movement. Thanks to all the folks who came out for George, George Floyd, who, who really understood that this is the moment to show that this has been systemic, that this is not a one-off, this is not bad apples, that the bad apples, if anything, are in the criminal justice system. So with that, I, I want to get in and talk to Ashley and Michelle. I want to be able to... Are they, they, here we go. Here's everybody. All right. Very cool. I'm, we're seeing all these other more beautiful folks. You don't need to see me anymore. <laughs> Vallejo PD, where you're from, Ashley and Michelle, is one of the worst police forces in the nation. And I'm sure you can speak a little bit more to that. But I just want to share that since 2010, your police force has killed 19 people, one of the highest rates in the country. And that your police force has shot at people running away, fired at unarmed people, used guns in, in off-duty arguments, beaten mentally ill people, and none of those cops have ever been held accountable. If anything, they've been promoted. And in the last 10 years, uh, $16 million in paid out in legal settlements. And, and the cops don't pay for that. That's, that's the community. So here we have a police force that is just wrong. And it's not the only one. You can find the same thing in Bakersfield and Phoenix, so many other cities. So I want to start off with you two. Wanna, I, I want to thank you for your lucha. You know, I, I want to thank you for the fight you're putting up. But I want to hear from you. 
you know, since Sean's murder, since his death, you, you've been on the streets. You were arrested outside Gavin or Newsom's house fighting for justice. So I, I want you to tell folks a little bit of how you've been able to take that, that uncomprehensible rage, that trauma, and how you've channeled it into, into the power and how you're, you're mobilizing folks. I think one of the most powerful things I ever heard you say was when you say justice for Sean, you're saying justice for all communities. Right. And, yeah, so please just just welcome, welcome and please. Well, first and foremost, thank you all for um, bringing this really important conversation to the table. Um, oftentimes, it's no one wants to have it, and you guys are on the forefront having this conversation that's much needed. Um, but first, <laughs> we're born and raised in San Francisco our whole lives. Uh, my brother, all, our whole family, uh, we've been in San Francisco for 25 years, and it took my brother being out in the city of Vallejo one night to be murdered by the Vallejo Police Department. So our family has no ties to the Vallejo Police Department, but since it happened, it was it was one of these things, it's a fight or flight situation. You either fight for your loved one or you know the grieving stage is too hard sometimes. But for us, my sister and I, we knew that if we sat back and, and let the system do, does what it does, we would see no justice. You know, we, uh, time after time, we hear so many stories, so many cases. Um, so the moment it happened, it was more of our family being distraught, of course. But I remember when we had our former attorney, he said, you guys need to get on camera. You guys have to go push your own narrative. And me and Ashley were like, no, we have two weeks off. Like, you know, we need a process that we lost our only brother. And once he said no, I took the no as like Sean spoke through him too, that I had to spring into action. I couldn't just sit back and not do anything. And it's been really hard, but you know, by the grace of God and God giving us strength, you know, we, we do this work to honor our brother, to honor so many loved ones, families who've lost the loved one, because this work is not easy. It's hard, you know, but. We I, also recognize that Sean isn't just one, one random case. This is, this happens all the time. And prior to living in San Francisco, prior to Sean being murdered, we had no idea how violent the Vallejo Police Department was. Um, prior to 2010, the Vallejo Police Department has murdered 37 men since 1997, all black and brown unarmed men. And so it's just one of those things where this city is so small and how and why is no one talking about this issue? And it's unfortunate that it took Sean being from San Francisco, a much bigger city, to shed more light on what's been going on in, in, in the city of Vallejo. So it's been a really big lucha, but I'm just thankful that we have the people we do in our community that really push us to do this work because without the support of our community, we wouldn't know what to do. And I'm just thankful I have a sister to do this fight with because most of the times you just see one parent or two parents and not really, you don't really see sisters really just taking on the system. Thank you both, thank you. Um, and I wanna move to Carmen and just come back. I wanna make sure we have a chance to hear from everybody. So Carmen, again, as I said before, huge gracias to your lucha, to what you've done. You know, you've been organizing on, on, on you know, stopping the inhumanity of the criminal justice system for the last 20 years in Santa Cruz, California, now nationally and everywhere and around the world. So, so my question with you, is, is how do we build an intersectional approach and not be exclusive to, to what we're trying to move forward for our folks? You know, how do, we, how do we move it from just being like, oh, this is a black issue. Oh, this is not a Latinx issue. How do we move forward and, and, and honor all of our communities? Thank you. Uh, I just want to thank everybody so much for having this conversation. I had mentioned to you that I have, was getting emotional because of the fact that for the past uh, two decades, I've been doing this work and oftentimes we are overlooked, um, especially those of us that sit at the intersection or are at the intersection of black and brown solidarity work, whether it's in prisons or in the streets, trying to fight against police brutality and also really proud of Michelle and Ashley, um, who for the past year have been going so hard, past year and a half have been going so hard. Um, but I believe that the way in which we move out of these silos and really build uh, multicultural um, solidarity, um, intercultural solidarity is by understanding um, that this issue is also a Latinx issue. Um, oftentimes, you know, history has shown us whether it was, you know, um, 
Latinos being killed um, or lynched in the Southwest and in California, about 600 of them, right? Um, and, and about 200 of them taking place in California. Um, also understanding that during the civil rights movement, um, there was a major collaboration between uh, black leaders and Chicano leaders that were both fighting against police brutality. Um, understanding that uh, state sanctioned violence against Latinos um, has had a major uh, part of this country's history and it's not stopped, right? It's important uh, that we know that this is not a new phenomenon, but a continuation of the past. And it comes from the same white supremacist roots as the police police killings of black Americans in this country. Um, you know, when we talk about Latinos being killed at the hands of police over the last six years, we've learned that an estimated 2,600 Lat Latinx people were killed by police or in custody, uh, but inaccurate data collection does not allow us to have real numbers. Um, the Latinx community, we are not a monolith. Right. Um, we come from different um, ethnicities and we're often erased by the tendency to frame things in a very black and white binary. Um, you know, we see that in the way the data is collected, collected about police violence um, and also the way it's reported by race and ethnicity ethnicity. In the case of Sean, we know that he was identified as African American, right? Often it is law enforcement who determines the race and ethnicity of the person they've killed. And Latinos are often miscategorized as black, uh, white or other. Um, and so I feel that we as Latinos um, must begin to see police violence as a Latino issue as well, especially when we know that history repeats itself and many of our leaders from the Chicano movement were fighting against it. Um, when we do that, we must also come into solidarity with our Black siblings who are organizing to stop police brutality. You know, one of the things that I constantly talk about is the fact that, you know, um, there is a scarcity model mentality, right? Um, this larger narrative that is being pushed um, by either the media or even philanthropy has not allowed um, uh, you know, us to understand um, that these issues impact those of us who have been here for a very long time. Um, philanthropy and media have siloed Latino issues um, to immigration reform, and it doesn't see police brutality as a Latinx issue. There has been a rightful push to invest more in Black-led BLM groups, which are still underfunded. So let's just be real, right? As we are looking at uh, funding um, BLM, uh, those groups are still underfunded, even after the uprising of George Floyd. Um, and so when we see this, um, we often see that Latinos doing the work on police brutality are often erased. Um, you mentioned, and I constantly say this, I've been doing this multicultural coalition uh, building, you know, fight against police brutality for over a decade um, and 20 years plus working with our people who are incarcerated. And I've experienced that, that firsthand. Um, you know, if we understand that it's important to bring others along, then we know that showing up in solidarity is also part of the solution. Um, and we can build a more sustained movement when we invite people to be part of our fight. Um, you know, I show up for Tamika Mallory and Linda Sarsour and, um, and Ramin, who is, you know, also a Muslim brother who's formerly incarcerated, my son, who's African-American, because I see my fight invested in him. My liberation is bound in, in his liberation and their liberation. Um, and so when uh, we as Latinx people are siloed, um, we often tend to believe what is being said about us. Um, you know, as a Chicana woman, um, you know, when I was told that Mexicans were lazy or that we were rapists, what happens is that that narrative begins to seep in our brains, right? Wait, what? Wait, is that what's being said? And so we need to stop believing that. We need to also understand history, knowing that we've always built a cross culture. Um, we need to continue to build that way. And we need to start understanding that there's enough for all of us. Yes, yes, yes. No, gracias, Carmen. There's so much there that I want to unpack. I'm so excited for this conversation. And 
you lifted up so many things that are at the heart of this of this fight of the struggle. Personally, I, I remember also being a young a young before I became a Chicano, a young little Mexican American, feeling that same self hate and getting those those respectability politics of mijo no son nosotros. You know, we don't yeah. we we're, we're respectable. The police don't bother us. If they have trouble with the police, that's on them. And it's such bullshit. Exactly. It's such bullshit. Um, so before we get into more of that, I want to talk to to Mr. Jimmy Briggs, documentarian, storyteller. Uh, who is at the Skoll Foundation. I want to hear, what, what is philanthropy's response at the moment? What, what is philanthropy's response to what is happening, not just uh, uh, with criminal justice, but specifically with policing in our communities? Uh, thank you so much. And at first, I just want to honor Ashley and Michelle. I'm so sorry for your loss, with Sean. And I'm so inspired by your struggle, sincerely. And it's always challenging to follow someone like Carmen in one of these discussions, but I will try. Um, you know, in answer to your question, I think some of the things are at play, and Carmen touched upon a lot of this. I think one, you know, philanthropy, like like society at large, is prone to believing the hype, believing the media mischaracterization of policing and policing accountability. Um, you know, to, to what I said before, um, historically, as we all recognize, policing injustice um, and brutality as historically framed as black and white. And I think philanthropy, just in the past year or so, has come to understand that this is actually not just you know confined to the black american community but also in particular impacting the latinx community indigenous communities as well as others in this country the muslim community among them and i think you know you know working with within philanthropy but also being a journalist it's really about several things one the narrative um we have to we have as a philanthropist working in philanthropy now i'm always striving to figure out ways to partner with organizations with in, individuals like carmen and others who are really creating counter narratives, counter narratives, who are helping us to put uh, these multi-systemic challenges, these multi-systemic oppressions within a framework of white supremacy that we're all living under, um, to, to bring them back into, into a clear focus so that, you know, it's really a matter of decentering whiteness. How do we you know not only have the issue of police accountability and justice um, spotlight the, the plight of black Americans, but also in turn and partnership and allyship Latinx Americans, um, Asian Americans, Indigenous Americans. Um, I think to be very honest with you, and, and, and it's interesting to have this conversation right now because earlier this summer, um, kind of the trade publication, the, the Chronicle of Philanthropy, um, actually did a story, a, a cover, cover story about philanthropy and public safety, including policing. And I think for a lot of a lot of foundations uh, in the giving and donor space, there's some there's some hesitation. Um, not, you know, not necessarily to to fund work around reframing public safety, but hesitation and in getting involved in the fight at all. Because you know, I think you know, for a lot of reasons, you know, this issue of, of police accountability, one which should be um, of concern to everyone, regardless of political affiliation, identity, economic status, and so forth, it's become like everything else in this country very divisive. And I think the philanthropic community, more than often than not, is afraid of the things that is taking aside either. You know, coming out on the side of of um, being against the police, which is you know, which is not the framing that people are saying, but really, or or, or the side of you know, blue lives matter and the police can do no wrong. We have to back them regardless. Um, I think what's needed is really proximity, listening, learning from individuals like Ashley and Michelle, uh, trusting people who've been doing this work for for a long time and a credibility like Carmen, and 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 taking really taking kind of a more humble approach to. We, we have to trust those, we have to listen to those who are most affected by the challenge of police and uh, brutality and justice. And in turn, those who are close to the issue, I, I believe, have the solutions. Um, it, you know, you know a, lot, a, lot, a lot of foundations are you know, focusing on issues like police, policing and harmful policing from a distance. They're not actually in the communities that are most affected. And I think, you know, to, to really to bridge the divide, yeah, I think there has to be, um, as I would say, some common ground, you know, people like myself at a foundation like the School Foundation, but others as well, other counterparts, uh, coming, you know, coming into a space where we, we recognize what we don't know, um, coming in with, you know, authenticity and, and sincerity to listen, even if it may be challenging, but also to come in and be held, be willing to be held accountable. I mean, Carmen noted, you know, the last year, there's a lot of, a lot of commitments made uh, from corporations, from foundations, in support of the Black Lives Matter movement in the wake of George Floyd's murder, uh, Breonna Taylor's murder, uh, too many other deaths of, of black and brown people at the hands of police. Most recently, some of you may have seen in the past week or so, 
the Washington Post had a pretty extensive story about the fact that those corporations and some foundations that made commitments never came through on them. And so I think, you know, it's up to us to not only engage philanthropy in a meaningful, authentic way, but be willing to hold them accountable, call them out, shame them if necessary, when, they're, when, they're not, when that being true to commitments they've made publicly or to the communities in which they've, in which they've uh, promised to serve or to, to help transform. Thank you, Jimmy. And if we could put us all four on screen, is there any way to make us equal size? No, it's just me big. <laughs> uh, on the note of corporations, I think it's funny. Today is Hispanic Heritage Month. It's the kickoff, which, you know, for me, every day is 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 Chicano Heritage Month, whatever. But it's it's fine. The corporations, though, corporations like Amazon and Microsoft, who are who may be celebrating today, are the same ones that are giving tools to policing and to, to ICE, right? Behenta has this tech out of ICE campaign, and it shows that these folks that are saying, oh, let's celebrate Latinos, Black Lives Matter, are the same folks profiting, profiting out of, out of our debts and out of our pain. Um, I want to go back. I want to go at, back to Ashley and, and Michelle. Uh, I remember earlier when we had spoken, you, you know, we had shared a little bit about how, how the Latinx Latino community was, was taking this. So I, I would love for you to tell me, you know, how have you been trying to mobilize the, the Latinx community? It's not always something that's receptive, right? So, so how have you found what has worked for you in trying to share your brother's story and trying to mobilize other folks to, to act? No te creas. It's really, it's been really hard. Um, it's one of those things where sometimes we feel like we have to incentivize our community to come out. Um, and it's also one of those things where in our community, in our Latino community specifically, we're taught to just keep our heads down and keep silent and, you know, don't cause any traction um, because of our fear of law enforcement um, and authority overall. So it's been, it's been hard, but what, what we, when we do encounter people from our community, we encourage them to no esperen hasta que sea su hijo. Don't wait for it to happen to your son or your daughter for you to join this movement, because likely it can happen to anyone. You know, my brother was on his knees with his, with his hands up and he knew what to do. But there's that chance where their law enforcement is still going to, you know, shoot. So it's one of those things where we encourage our community to not wait until it happens to them and to get involved and to support those the families from their community, whether it's supporting an impacted family from your neighborhood, bringing them a hot meal or just things like that. Just show up for your community um, in the best way of your ability. So that's what we've been trying to do. Um, we try to organize and, and have all of our community come out. Luckily here in San Francisco, um, it's always a big turnout. You know, our, our, our in San Francisco, it's a really close knit family type of community. But for other cities like in Vallejo, it's really hard to get families out because of their fear, um, specifically towards the Vallejo Police Department. And it's one of these things too, like, like Ashley said, it's really important that we always say not it's not just about Sean, it's about everybody, right? And letting us know all the families that when we fight for Sean, we're fighting for you too. When we're pushing for policy and legislation, we're pushing it for your loved one too. When we go to the Capitol and testify in person and see what assembly members and what senators are on the fence about legislation, you know, really targeting them too and just being like, Hey, our loved ones are the ones who, who are no longer here. We're the ones Carrying the baton, you know, Sean's last text message just 30 minutes be mm. before he was murdered was to sign a petition to get justice for George Floyd. I responded by saying just did it and actually reacted by heart because we were those so close. We're more like triplets. But it was one of those things with Sean's last text message to my sister and I. People may think it was an isolated thing, but it's not. This is just a reflection of how um, we were at home, you know, how we, my parents raised us in the way of carrying these conversations. So Sean knew by going out for George Floyd that he saw himself there, right? And it's just, it's unfortunate what happened to my brother just 30 minutes after, but it was that baton he passed to me and Ashley. And we mm -hmm. hope to pass that baton off to so many other families and letting them know, even though your loved one may have been murdered 10, 20 years ago, you know, you're still in this fight too, you know? And we've seen families who've said, I haven't been out in 14 years until I saw you two ladies come out. And now I'm gonna come out because I know how powerful you guys are and us all collectively together. And for us, it's about build, continuing to build the unity. And and I feel like the, when we come all together and we join this fight together, you know, we're more powerful. You know, the white supremacy system is fear, it fears them seeing the, the unity. And, you know, our work isn't done. Um, we stra strategize and organize and mobilize. Um, thank God we have the mentorship of Ms. Carmen Perez to help mm -hmm. guide us in this space because we realize that it's, it's a really hard fight, you know, but we are seeing changes. We are seeing little victories. You know, we haven't received justice yet, but we know receiving justice is implementing laws and legislation that 
what happened to Sean can no longer happen to somebody. That Sean yes. is, that yes. even us being bold and saying that we want to be the last family for the Vallejo Police Department to murder our loved one. Mm. You know, we recognize it's really bold to say, but sometimes you have to be bold. You know, we have to shake shake things up and speak our truth to power. So this is what our work is day to day, and you know, we're gonna bring we're gonna bring change. I'm de- I'm declaring mm. it. We're gonna bring change yes, to yes, the city yes, of Vallejo, yes. but not only there, all of California, all the United States. You know. So, yes. Yeah. Gracias, gracias. Yes, yes, yes. And and in Carmen, your, your name's coming a lot. You you have been a leader. You have been helping folks come out and and be fierce. And and thanks to your work, folks are, are not afraid and they're able to come out and to organize. So, so I guess my question for you is, you know, what do funders need to fund? What do you need to make your work? How do we how do we help Carmen inspire more Michelle and Ashley's? How, what what do you need to the folks in the room that are watching this? You know, do, should we just cut you an even larger check? Put all the checkbooks, folks. What? Tell us. Tell us how. Tell us what can you use? What can these folks watching do to really help us mobilize more and more folks? One, um, of course, it's always about funding. I think what I want people to understand that we do not get funding for police accountability mm. work at all. Uh, for the past decade, everything that you've seen from. Um, you know, our 250 mile march to bring awareness in 2015. Um, none of that was funded. We use our own credit cards to to support families. Um, and when I saw Michelle and Ashley, I had to reach out to their family. Um, we have this funny internal story about, you know, missing one another. Uh, but I said to them, you know, I don't have much, but I do have the experience of organizing and my role is to cultivate the next generation of leaders those that are actually directly impacted and so we brought them into our fellowship program but even prior to that you know we help them with talking points we um help them organize you know the shutdown at at the governor's mansion where they got arrested Mm -hmm. Um, we organized for them the toucan weekend and sometimes the bill that we receive is a 90 to $150,000 bill that we don't want to impose on the family. That is not the strain that they need. And so, yes, it's about, you know, investing in leaders uh, like myself and others that have been doing this work, as well as investing in the families, um, allowing them to receive the support, not just financial, but the mental health support that they need. Um, You know, there's, there's so much every single day crisis that is going on in our communities. And not only are they fighting for Sean or their, their own family member, but they're now showing up for the movement. So mm-hmm. invest in organizations like the Gathering for Justice and leaders like myself and like Ashley and Michelle, but also know that there's a lane for you, right? Whatever gift you have, bring that to the cause. Raise an awareness about the issue of police brutality within um, the Latinx community. Demand that there is more accurate data as it pertains to Latinos being killed at the hands of police. Provide the systems that need to be mm-hmm. developed. Um, let's do some training on data collection right um and also like race analysis um you know let's continue to provide opportunities for young people like michelle and ashley and jakey serbin out of stockton who was you know beaten by police to have access to organizations like the gathering but Mm -hmm. also to go through leadership development. Um, They are the ones that are closest to the problem. And, you know, I will say, you know, my first experience with police was at a very young age um, being picked up by them. um, But I was taken to the basketball court and, you know, but I did witness my brothers being hogtied, um, you know, held at gunpoint. That I thought was normal, right, in Oxnard, California. I thought that was part of the way in which everybody was treated until I went to UC Santa Cruz and that wasn't everybody's story. So, you know, we also have to demand that police are not over policing communities of color. Um, We need to elevate the stories of Latinos. And and I I know that people like um, uh, Jorge Ramos has done a really good job, Alicia Melendez, you know, we've been able to build some unlike uh, un- unlikely allies that really promote our stories because they do care. And I do want to say Latinos do care about this issue. We just don't have the resources to yes, really be yes. elevated at the level that it should be. So, you know, yes, they could say, you know, este no es mi problema or, you know, yo no quiero, you know, I don't want to get involved, but they do. They actually do care. They do show up, but we need more investment in this issue. Um, and again, it's not, it, it, it should be something that is 
on every um, philanthropy conference being mm -hmm. talked about. And so I really yes. applaud yes. Hispanics and philanthropy to taking this opportunity to have this very important conversation. Yes, yes, huge. Gracias. It's, it's the only foundation that I know of that is having this conversation, the courage to have it. Um, and, and thank you for, for what you said, Carmen, and I hope folks were taking notes. I mean, I, I know there are other Latinx organizations out there like Poder in Tucson or Mi Gente or OCAD in Chicago that have to work on this. They've started working on it because they have no other choice. So we have 19 minutes left, which is way not enough time, <laughs> but we're going to try to pack it in. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. And we can't go further without really trying to talk about solutions. So I have a question for Jimmy. So we're going to talk about what, what has been the buzz the entire summer, this idea of defund the police, right? Folks might not understand it and they freak out like, oh, my God, there's going to be no cops, which and, and that, I'm an abolitionist. I think that's great. <laughs> but first, we have to understand what that actually means, right? Kelly Leiter Hernandez recently said 8% of what police do is, is responding to what people fear the most. Only 8%. The other 90% is traffic tickets and other things harassing our community. Only 8%. So, so for you, Jimmy, can you speak a little bit about philanthropy's reaction to this idea of defunding the police, which actually means giving resources to our people? So when we say defund the police, we're saying give us mental health issues, give us resources, give us gyms, let us go to college, give us good jobs. That's what that means. So, so can you speak a little about philanthropy's reaction to that? Thanks so much, Ramo. Um, just reflecting what Carmen said, but also what Ashley Michelle Said, said as well. Um, I think one of the things, and, and HIP is, is that, you know, I'm so excited personally um, to be a partner with HIP through the School Foundation, uh, works on this issue. But I think, frankly speaking, we have to have more Latinx people in philanthropy, more mm -hmm. program officers, more VPs, more CEOs, more staffers who, you know, who can, one, um, have the credibility, can make, make the personal, more personal arguments um, the informed arguments within the foundations that this is an issue of concern to the community and that that particular institution needs to be a part of uh, the solution or search for the solution. Um, you know, like, like too many other uh, you know, communities of color, um, the Latinx community is grossly underrepresented within philanthropy, within the foundation leadership. And that's, that's, that's something that, you know, that's my own personal call to the community. We have to do better. Um, and speaking as an African-American, I can tell you we have to do better as an industry. Um, also, and, and this, I'm going to get to your, get to your point, Carmen. I, I want to say something too. And I was thinking about this when Ashley Michelle was speaking. Um, and I'm thinking about trauma and intergenerational trauma. I mean, mm. you know, you know, earlier we called up the names of, 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 of Latinx women and men um, who died at the hands of police. Uh, and I just, you know, especially as Ashley Michelle were talking, I was just thinking about how many times have these stories been told by our parents, grandparents, cousins, extended family colleagues and friends across the country. And what does that do to our communities? What does that, what does that tell us about ourselves? Uh, I mean, people, I think at a certain point, people believe this is just what happens to them. This is what happens to, happens in black and, and Latinx communities and other communities of color. Um, the police abuse us, um, our, 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 our cries for justice, our actions for justice are not heard, are not, are not, not heeded. And I think, you know, I, I, I raised that because, you know, for myself, you know, working at the institution at the School Foundation, Ramo, I'm always talking about how, you know, the work we have to do within philanthropy is not just about, you know, writing a check, you know, to an organization and keep it moving, but really understand that you know, we, we have to work both through a trust-based lens, but also a trauma-informed lens. That the communities and organizations, leaders like Carmen and others who, you know, who, who have earned, more than earned uh, support, uh, more than earned uh, the credibility and trust, um, the traumas that they, that's been carried in individual and organizations, and and that so that the, the, the support we provide, the financial support, should go towards general operating expenses, but it should also go towards the wellness of people doing this work, or organizations doing this work. I, I think when it comes to the question of defund the police, to, to your point, Ramo, I mean, the phrase defund the police, I'll just be honest with you all, from a philanthropic perspective, it's challenging because. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people in philanthropy, you know, across across the across the region, across the country, who, you know, when they hear that phrase, feel one way or another about it. And you know, and and as someone as someone who wants to be a part of the solution, support what's happening on the front line, on the grassroots, it's you know, I do I have to do a lot of education, a re-education around defund the police doesn't think what you may, may initially think it means. 
What it means is that we that the communities most impacted by police brutality and violence are asking for reallocation of funding so that we can have uh, community members who are responders to call to to domestic violence situations, who are responders to mental health crisis, who are responders to uh, overdose crisis when people are are, are are struggling with with use of drugs, misuse of drugs. The community is asking for the resources and the trust to respond to these to these challenges that often draw on the police. And, and 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 too often end up and 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 harmful yeah. uh, fatal encounters um it's really about you know reallocating funding reallocating priorities no one I mean you know from my perspective as a, as a working in philanthropy you know i i know that you know that that uh a police list communities uh, may happen one day and in the future they probably won't but, mm. but what needs to happen is that we need to, to put the, the resources the money the capital uh, into organizations, into leaders who have who have who have the greatest credibility and who have the vision for the greatest impact, the social entrepreneurs in the space, and that and these are people like Carmen and others who think yeah. multisystemically. It's not just the police; it's healthcare, it's education, mm -hmm. it's housing, it's food. That's yes. all a part of what goes into making a community safe. And, and bringing up overdose raised my ears. I worked the Drug Policy Alliance for a while, and, and I learned that in the '80s, when Black and Latino folks were dying from crack, it was criminalized. They passed legislation to lock us up even longer, but now that white folks are overdosing, they're promoting harm reduction, and they're decriminalizing drugs. So it, white supremacy is at the root of policing. It is so clear. When it's a white person being picked up, they might end up in a harm reduction program. If it's a Latino, they're gonna lock us up. And right now, I'm in Brooklyn, on Rikers Island, over 10 people have died this year alone, and that is state violence, and that is policing. But because it's black and brown lives, you're not seeing it on the national news. And that's happening today, and our mayor is doing nothing. So, so again, I, I want to take what you said, Jimmy, about systemic solutions. And Carmen, I want to go to you again, and I want to ask, what do these systemic solutions look like? At the Gathering for Justice, you do so much. So, so what does that look like? So defunding the police is attached to what, and how do we really make our community safe? What, what does that look like for you, and what would you need to get it done? I think, you know, I, I really invite, um, you know, people to think of us as thought partners, right, um, in this field and to really think big. Um, I feel that the Gathering for Justice, um, the way in which we're able to uh, bring people into the space by just wrapping our arms around them, right? There's not um, this like, let me tell you how to do it, but it's more so like, let me listen to you and what your needs are and let's drive this together, right? You you may uh, make a right turn here, uh, we may go straight, but we're all gonna be at the same destination together. And so I think that's part of the, the way in which we organize with families, we organize with community. When we were um, brought in to run a campaign for a young man by the name of Pedro Hernandez, who was on Rikers mm -hmm. for over two years with, I believe, a $250,000 bail, mm -hmm. um, I had a conversation with their mom on a Friday. And then by Monday, I organized 50 organizations to come together in support of the family. And we yes. broke it up in four areas. One was mental health. The other was education. Right. The third was around activation and bringing public awareness. And the fourth was around his bail and law. Um, so giving folks the ability to come in as a coalition, as a network, offer their expertise, because I'm not a, a gatekeeper. I'm here to say, hey, mm -hmm. there's a lane for you. Right. We have this family. We need to all invest our time and our expertise in these in these folks. Um, and so I, I feel that the gathering, the way in which we look at it is we have um, two state task force. One is one is called Justice League California. The other is Justice League New York, City, New York City. You'll see a lot of the work, which is a little bit more visible in Justice League New York City because of the fact that we do really big things. But the way we have committees, and these are all volunteer folks, right, who have very successful jobs, they come in and we are their passion project. These are the mm -hmm. folks that say, I'm also invested in this issue because I'm personally impacted, right? Um, we have rap artists, we have communication directors, we have researchers. And so we collect data and the folks that know how to translate data, translate the data back to our community, right? The folks that know how to amplify the message are amplifying the message, but we need everybody to come together and provide their expertise. And that's really the way in which we 
um, train uh, people within Justice League or the Gathering for Justice. We give them the ability to understand that, you know, there are also one on one conversations that we have with Michelle and Ashley as the CEO mm. president of the Gathering for Justice. I mm. would meet with them before the major event that we had in San Francisco every morning for 15 minutes just to mm. do a welfare check on them. Right. But they would also have meetings with our whole team. I believe it was like twice a week. Um, and so they were really invested in getting justice for their brother, as well as we were invested in supporting them and getting justice. Um, but what we can't provide, there are other organizations that they are working with, like ASJ, that will provide for them, right? So it's also understanding that it's not just about the gathering for justice. It's not going to be the end and all be all, but that we're going to collaborate with other organizations that could also provide the support that they need. Um, but again, I really want to welcome folks to bring us in as thought partners as you're building out the portfolio, whether you're you're wanting to work on racial injustice or you're wanting to work on police accountability, bring us in to have these conversations with you. Um, but always know that there's a lane for everybody and let's center the people that are directly impacted. That's just kind of just reminding folks, we have eight minutes left. So if you have questions, please bring them in. Any comments, praise, that's also welcome as well. All these people are phenomenal. So please let them know what you're thinking. I, I want to talk a little bit about the needs of impacted family members. I, I know Mijente has started organizing, trying to connect the dots for Latinx folks, letting them know, you know, this is our issue. It's not just immigration, but even within immigration, which is a pipeline into the criminal justice system, there are abuses there as well. So, so for impacted families, Michelle and, and, and Ashley, what are, the, what are the needs, the immediate needs? I, I think of the story I read about an undocumented family where the police accidentally went to his door. It wasn't even the right place and they shot and killed him. And of course they, they, they weren't charged with anything. And that family was afraid to ask for resources because they were undocumented. But what are the ways that, that folks can be in support immediately after. You know, I, I can't imagine the trauma folks are experiencing. So so what are the other things that, that could be provided and, and that could be done to help families in need? Surprisingly enough, there is no victim's compensation for families affected mm. by police violence. Um, families affected by police violence aren't even seen as survivors. And mm. so families have to rely on GoFundMe uh, the community, oh their neighbors have to give them meal trains. Uh, we have the privilege enough for our neighbors to give us a hot meal for dinner every night for two months oh. after grieving, Sean, because between interviews and grieving and planning a funeral and trying to get the story out, it's too much. And families forget basic things like even eating or sleeping. Mm. And so back to victims' compensation, victims' compensation would give access to mental health resources, um, burial funds, and anything else in between, housing relocation, some impacted families lose their loved one in their homes and they're stuck to live, reliving and re-traumatizing tra tra themselves in the same environment in which their loved one was murdered. And so here in California, we have been championing on SB 299, which is victims' compensation for families affected by police violence. And Michelle and I have been going to the state capitol and testifying and, and doing everything we can, having our community make those phone mm -hmm. calls, in which we finally made it to, we're almost close to passing it out of appropriations and getting it onto the governor's desk. Mm -hmm. So we're almost there at the finish line, and we really hope that it does get signed into law um, because it's unrealistic that families have to make car washes or sell plates or do whatever just to collect the very few pennies yeah. they can to bury their loved one or even pay their rent and things like that while they're going through so much. So I would just say, you know, movements die when there is no funding, but there's also basic needs that families do need, like paying rent or taking time off work. There isn't even bereavement leave really for in California. Mm -hmm. Bereavement leave is only what three days. You can only get so much done in three days while you're grieving the, lo um, the loss of your loved one. So there's a lot to do. Um, but, you know, I'm thankful Michelle and I are being used as vessels to do this work. And it's one of these things that Ashley um, touched on. It's some families don't even can't even scramble enough from their communities, right? Some communities are very small. Some communities care, but they, it, you know, everyone has things going on in their own personal lives that families can't even give a, pro a proper burial for their loved ones. That they have to seek out to cremation, you know, and that's something they didn't want to do. So when we go, we've been around the whole state of California and have gone to Kentucky and to Wauwatosa, Wisconsin, and have met with so many families and they've told us like, I, I didn't even have enough to scramble to bury my loved one, you know? So when the state murders your loved one, the worst thing is that no one's there to show up to support you. So 
I guess our call is just to support any family you hear. There's always going to be a Sean Monterosa in your community. Mm -hmm. There's always going to be a Paul yeah. Rea in your community. There's always going to be Andres and Eric Salgado. So many people, you know, so it's, it's, it's very sad that, you know, it continues to happen. And that's why Ashley and I have been doing everything we can to be on the policy and legislation end too, because we know that sometimes you have to have one foot on the streets and one foot in the, in the back end pushing for the policy because, that's the only way we're going to hold the system accountable, you know? So, yeah, there's a lot to do, though. Like Carmen always says, there's a lane for everybody. So I hope that if you ever encounter a situation or some, or you meet a family like ours, that if you have resources, show up to the door and give them resources or a meal, you know, a translation. Um, some families need interpreters, you know. Fortunate enough, me and Ashley are bilingual, but some families only speak one language and there's no one there to support them. So there, there's always a lane for everybody. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to add, I think what's really um, beautiful about being able to work with Ashley and Michelle and and um, and Alvin Cole's sister and Jakey Servin is we we get to work with so many people that are impacted by police brutality. And we hear the same thing over and over. And one of the things that we've been talking about is actually having a dream session together of like, what would be the blueprint to like, what would be the the how to guide right for families just to receive something um and even you know i'm going to i'm going to dream big here but you know i've been talking to ashley and michelle let's build a round table for latinx families um to to be able to come together um and actually share what they've been experiencing what their needs are you know i'm like we'll we'll have a little you know ta taco uh, we'll put some tacos together, some rice yes, and beans, yes. we'll have little, you know, uh, yeah. lunch, lunch, you know, whatever it need, whatever needs to happen. But you no, know, just want to make sure that that we also get to bring uh, to to dream big together. So that's just kind of what we have two minutes left. There's a question about how can we defund the police when there are many so many people with guns out in the streets. Uh, I'm just going to say quickly, I don't think the police keep us safe. I'm going to answer that even though I'm not on the panel. <laughs> I'm going to go to closing. Unless anybody wants to tackle that in 30 seconds, Carmen or, or Jimmy, do you want to tackle that? How do you defund when there's so many guns on, on, the, on the streets in the U.S.? 30 second answer, anybody? I, I would just go back to what I said before. Um, you know, part of what I said before, I just say that um, to, to, to deal with the guns on the streets, we have to address the, the non-police issues like education, housing, employment, uh, food security, mental health support within the community for the community. Um, I think I think that non-police intervention services and, and needs addressing those that we can we can deal with the guns in the streets. Okay, beautifully said, Jimmy. That, that's good. If anybody took a tweet of that, that was wonderful. Put that on Twitter. Closing statements. Closing statements. Otra vez, again, gracias a todos. This is a conversation that would not have happened a year ago even. So again, gracias to, to Jasmine Chavez, to Carmen, to Ashley, uh, uh, to Michelle, to Jimmy. So, so I'm going to start off with, I'm going to give the, the Monterosa sisters the last word. So Jimmy, I'm going to start off with you and go to Carmen next. So Jimmy, last last words for your colleagues. Uh, just again, I'm just, I was so honored to be in this conversation with you all. I hope we can continue it at the end of the sitting or just directly. Um, and, you know, personally, you know, I, I want to work with you, Carmen, and work with you and Ashley, Michelle, to, to the dreams that you just expressed, I'd love to help be a part of making them, make them, make them happen. Thank you, Jimmy. Carmen. I just want to thank everybody again for this opportunity. It was such an honor to be on a panel with my fellow, um, you know, they're my family, they're my daughters. Um, and Yasmin, thank you so much for bringing um, this conversation to the stage. And Jimmy, I'm looking forward to doing some major uh, dream sessions with you and, and everybody on here. Um, I just want to remind people, you know, we must begin, begin to see police violence as a Latino issue um, and also resist together, right? We also can do that while we're building solidarity with our, our Black siblings, um, our API family, um, and also um, advocate for policies like the George Floyd uh, Justice and Policing which is, is an important act as well as SB2. I'll, I'll let the, the sisters talk about that. Um, and let's also vote out some of these DAs, um, right? And, and state attorneys uh, generals who are committing, um, uh, who are not committing to holding uh, police accountable. Um, the power to make change lies in our solidarity with one another. And so again, thank you so much for this conversation. I look forward to building with all of you in the future. And Ashley and Michelle, you have the last word. 
we just want to say thank you and we are so grateful for you guys and including us and including families voices you know oftentimes we're we're felt unseen and you guys are really paving the way to uplift our voices and and our stories so just thank you and jimmy carmen we are so excited to continue to build with you guys and you know let's continue to pass this baton to so many families and center their voices and you know someday we'll all get us to the white house and with some demands someday so and actually i just i'm just at loss for words this was a much needed conversation and i hope it's not the last one and that we can maybe even make this like a whole series type of thing um but this is was amazing i'm just super thankful mm -hmm. and i look forward to building with everyone y con eso gracias a ustedes gracias to, to zach and lara on the back end you can't see them but thank you to them as well y gracias a todos thank you so much everybody have a great day gracias